This is Mark Matson, your host of Brain Ponderings Podcast, and this is going to be a special episode today. Um, it's summertime. I have a gap in having uh, invited guests, and I think it's a good time to preview my book called Sculptor and Destroyer, Tales of Glutamate, the Brain's Most Important Neurotransmitter, which will be released in August. And this book... Uh, covers a gamut on glutamate, an amino acid that uh, is evolutionarily conserved as a critical neurotransmitter. I'm going to talk about the, the sculptor comes from the evidence that glutamate controls the formation of synaptic connections and the wiring, if you will, of circuitry during brain development, and that... Um, it also plays a role in what's called neuroplasticity modifications in synapses and neural connections throughout life in response to environmental demands. And then the destroyer aspect comes from the fact that uh, glutamate can kill neurons when its receptors are activated excessively. Uh, evidence suggests this occurs in severe epileptic seizures, stroke, but also in age-related neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, share my screen. And for those of you who are just listening on audio, if you want to, to actually see the visuals of what I'm going to show, you can go to my YouTube channel. Okay, so... This first uh, slide here is just uh, shows the cover of the book, Sculptor and Destroyer, and the table of contents. And so, as I mentioned, it's divided into kind of two main sections, roles of glutamate uh, during evolution in, in regulating cell morphology and the construction of various tissues, no, most notably nervous systems. And then um, and then I'll talk about the destroyer side. And towards the end, in these later chapters, uh, I'll talk about how one might optimize their glutamatergic signaling, that is, signaling that synapses that use glutamate uh, throughout life to enhance cognition and reduce the risk of your neurons being destroyed by glutamate, particularly as you age. Okay, so this is just a simple schematic of human brain with the different regions of cerebral cortex, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, motor cortex, sensory cortex, and then subcortical structures, notably cerebellum, uh, hippocampus, critical role in learning and memory, vulnerable in Alzheimer's disease and epileptic seizures, uh, and then more primitive brain regions, the brain stem and midbrain. Now, it turns out that more than 90% of all neurons in the brain deploy glutamate as their neurotransmitter. The other neurotransmitters uh, then, of course, constitute fewer neurons and synapses. Uh, second to glutamatergic neurons is GABAergic inhibitory neurons. And I'll talk about the interactions between excitatory glutamatergic signaling and GABAergic inhibitory signaling. The other neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, the only way they affect behaviors, that is affect functions, outputs of our brain, is by modulating the ongoing activity of excitatory glutamatergic neurons. Um, and these serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, those neurons are very few in number, less than 1% of the total number of neurons in the brain. And the cell bodies of those neurons are located in the brainstem or midbrain, these more primitive regions of the 
brain. Now, what I'm going to do for each chapter, I'm going to go through this and I'm going to read a couple of quotes from each chapter. I try to provide historical perspectives on this, um, interesting personal stories on some of the key scientists who have worked on uh, glutamate's role in the nervous system over the years. And then uh, I'll give a kind of in schematic form, outline some of the key features of glutamatergic signaling in the context of each chapter. So the first chapter is just background information on the neurotransmitter glutamate. How is this amino acid, which most people will think of amino acids as building block, blocks of proteins, which is certainly a critical role, but turns out that glutamate and the other neurotransmitters, uh, glutamate is an amino acid and the other neurotransmitters are produced from amino acids. So this first quote is as follows. While World War II was raging in Europe and the Pacific, Pro Professor Takahashi Hayashi was performing experiments at Keio University in Tokyo that provided the first evidence that glutamate can excite neurons. Hayashi injected glutamate in the brain of a dog and observed that the dog had exhibited epileptic seizures. Considering the social environment of imperialist Japan at the time, Hayashi must have had considerable motivation and persistence to pursue such experiments. Interestingly, he was also a poet, and perhaps both his poetry writing and experiments on dogs enabled him to retreat from the turmoil of war. At the time <clears throat> Hayashi published the results of experiments, his experiments, Jeffrey Watkins was a boy in high school in Australia. Watkins had a keen interest in chemistry. And after going to college in Australia, he obtained a PhD from Cambridge University in England. Watkins and the physiologist David Curtis showed that glutamate can cause the depolarization and firing of neurons. They used spinal cords that had been removed from a species of toad native to Australia. The spinal cords were cut into segments to increase the access of glutamate to the neurons. A recording electrode was placed in a ventral root, which is a large bundle of motor neuron axons. Another electrode, the ground electrode, was placed in the salt solution bathing the spinal cord. They found that glutamate had enhanced the firing of the motor neurons. According to Watkins, he had decided <clears throat> to see if glutamate had an effect on the neurons simply because there happened to be a bottle of glutamate in the lab. And <laughs> turns out it's not unusual for uh, someone to discover something just by trying a lot of different things and seeing what has an effect. And that's what happened there. Uh, he had a bottles of various uh, substances on the shelf and just added them and see if they affected the neuron's excitability. Uh, so glutamate is one of the simplest uh, amino acids. It has five carbons and um, two oxygens and then a number of uh, hydrogens and one nitrogen group. GABA, the inhibitory transmitter, turns out is produced from glutamate uh, by the activity and en of an enzyme called glutamate decarboxylase. Acetylcholine is produced from choline. Serotonin is produced from the amino acid tryptophan. Both norepinephrine and dopamine are produced from the amino acid tyrosine. As I mentioned, uh, it's well known that amino acids, including glutamate, are constituents of proteins. And in this slide, I'm just showing two examples from uh, a previous podcast I had with Tom Foltini on what are called GLP-1 
analogs, modified forms of GLP-1 glucagon-like peptide 1, which is this hormone that turns out to be effective in treating diabetes and obesity. And we think Parkinson's disease based on initial preclinical studies done uh, in laboratories, including mine at the NIH, and then the clinical work done by Tom Foltini. So this, this highlights that GLP-1 itself has four glutamates, and this uh, xenotide, this Gila monster peptide uh, that has similar structure to GLP-1 and is active, as active or more active than GLP-1 and is now used to treat diabetes. And that's what Tom Foltini tested in and showed in initial studies that it has beneficial effects in Parkinson's disease. Okay. Also, uh, in addition to being a neurotransmitter, glutamate is involved in energy metabolism. It's involved in what's called the TCA cycle, tricarboxylic acid cycle. It's involved in ATP production. Um, but the bulk focus of this book is on glutamate acting uh, mainly at synapses, but also before synapses form, actually, in developing neurons. Uh, so this slide shows a glutamatergic synapse with glutamate being released into the synaptic cleft, and then it will bind uh, to glutamate receptors. And, and the glutamate is rapidly removed from synapses by glutamate transporters that move the glutamate into either presynaptic terminals of the axon releasing glutamate, or importantly into astrocytes, these glial cells that kind of ensheath synapses throughout the brain. And glutamate, the way it excites neuron is by activating receptors that are sodium channels. So glutamate binds to this protein in the membrane of the neuron, and that causes a change in the, the structure of the glutamate receptor such that sodium can pass from outside the neuron to inside the neuron down its concentration gradient. Sodium's normally high, outside of neurons low, inside of neurons, and that creates this voltage dependence, voltage potential across the membrane. Uh, so glutamate binds, you get sodium influx and depolarization. Glutamate binds to a particular type of receptor called the AMPA receptor. That's the sodium channel. But it also binds to another type of receptor, the NMDA receptor, that's a calcium channel. So the bottom line is glutamate will cause sodium influx, membrane depolarization, and then calcium influx through NMDA receptors. And calcium, throughout the book, <laughs> calcium is a big theme because this increase in intracellular calcium levels plays critical roles in learning and memory, synaptic plasticity, but also in the destructive side of glutamate in damaging and even killing neurons. Now, normally with just kind of the normal ongoing activity of the glutamatergic synapses in our brains as I tell you these things and you listen to them, uh, that sodium and calcium are normally rapidly removed from the postsynaptic cell via the activity of energy-dependent sodium pumps and calcium pumps, proteins in the membrane. So this depolarization and repolarization is constantly going on at synapses in our brains as we think and behave. Now, I mentioned earlier on that throughout the brain, throughout the cerebral cortex, hippocampus, cerebellum, you name it, any brain region, um, the core neural circuitry is excitatory glutamatergic neurons, and then inhibitory GABAergic neurons. 
the glutamatergic neurons, their axons are often very long. They can project, for example, to other neur other neurons within the same brain, re brain region or even to different brain regions, for example, from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex, from the occipital cortex to the uh, subcortex, other regions of the cortex involved in processing of visual information. And in the most extreme case in terms of long axons, motor neurons in the motor cortex, so-called upper motor neurons, their axons of those glutamatergic neurons can extend all the way down into the spinal cord where they uh, stimulate the lower motor neurons uh, that then send axons to the muscle cells. Okay, and then these inhibitory GABAergic neurons, they have relatively short axons that only extend within brain regions typically. And their role is to kind of turn off the glutamate signal, turn off the excitation when it's no longer uh, relevant to the ongoing behavior action. So they play a role in, in rapidly uh, turning off and constraining the glutamatergic neural network activity within normal limits. And then the other neurotransmitters, as I mentioned, uh, they will synapse upon glutamatergic neurons and or GABAergic neurons and, and modify their activity. <clears throat> now, in, in this slide, and, and I'll try to describe it for those who are listening, it, it shows uh, sections uh, through the cerebellum and the cerebral cortex. Uh, and the neurons are stained with a stain called Golgi stain. And this stain uh, will, it's really interesting. Uh, when you stain a brain section with the Golgi stain, only some of the neurons will stain heavily with this dye, which to, reacts with a silver stain. So it, they're essentially black. And a neuron that stains will, will just be wonderfully stained throughout the extent of the dendrites that are shown in this so-called Purkinje cell in the cerebellum or axons shown here. And so you can visualize the entire morphology, the entire structure of neurons uh, with this Golgi stain. And Santiago Ramoni Cajal in the early 1900s used Golgi stain to, to describe for the first time the cellular architecture of the brains. And he did this in brain sections from human brain, uh, rats, cats, number of different species. Just wonderful work. And and back then, uh, he didn't have cameras to take pictures. And so he had to draw what he saw. And so he described that this um, was now recognized as a six-layer organization of the cerebral cortex with these pyramidal neurons. Uh, kind of their cell bodies are organized into layers. And there's a really interesting circuitry that goes on here in terms of the intrinsic circuitry communication within the cerebral cortex or from cerebral cortex to other brain regions. And so essentially chapter one describes, you know, what is glutamate? How does it act at a synapse? What do the glutamatergic neurons look like? And what are the different brain regions their and their functions uh, that are controlled by glutamate acting as a neurotransmitter. Then the second uh, chapter is something I've been interested in for a long time, and that has to do with brain evolution. And it turns out that 
glutamate is an ancient neurotransmitter. So here's uh, three quotes from that chapter. Glutamate probably first appeared on Earth about four billion years ago. Evidence for this date comes from the famous experiments performed by Stanley Miller beginning in 1952 when he was a graduate student at the University of Chicago. Miller ran a continuous stream of steam into a mixture of oxygen, ammonia, and methane. He then exposed that gaseous mi mixture to an electrical discharge and a week later used a method called paper chromatography to detect several amino acids. Glutamate was one of the amino acids produced in Miller's primordial soup experiments. It was a big, next quote, it was a big surprise to both plant biologists and neuroscientists where gene sequencing studies revealed that many plants have more genes for glutamate receptors than do humans. So plants, plant cells use glutamate for intercellular signaling. Evidence suggests that the expression of some of the genes in, are involved in the plant's adaptive responses to stress uh, controlled by glutamate. For example, when a leaf on a plant is damaged, other undamaged leaves increase their production of defensive chemicals that function as natural pesticides. This mechanism can protect a plant from being totally destroyed by an insect. Glutamate receptors are involved in this defensive response. Glutamate receptors have also been shown to mediate leaf-to-leaf -leaf wound healing in plants, as well as controlling the growth of, of roots and leaves in the plants. Um, and I talk about in this chapter a number of different uh, organisms in which glutamate uh, plays a role in their development, not just in animals and mammals and humans. And then I have a quote about the modulation of the glutamatergic activity uh, by the other neurotransmitters. The only way that serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, acetylcholine, and GABA can affect cognition, emotions, and behaviors is by acting upon glutamatergic neurons. Moreover, the activity of all neurons that use these other neurotransmitters are controlled by glutamatergic neurons. Glutamate is their master and commander. For these re reasons, I refer to these other neurotransmitters as underlings. This is not to say that the underling neurotransmitters are unimportant, Quite the contrary, they play critical roles in modulating the activity of glutamatergic neurons in ways that enable optimal brain function and adaptations of neural networks to environmental challenges. Okay, so I mentioned uh, plants as one uh, prominent type of organism that evolved before humans that uses glutamate in signaling and, and responses to stress. Of course, uh, glutamate also plays a major role in our responses to stress. And I've had multiple podcasts talking about stress with Robert Sapolsky and, and Joseph Ledoux and others and, um, and the amygdala and so on, its role in, in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal stress axis. It turns out, though, you can go all the way back to bacteria. The first living cells, as far as is known, that appeared on Earth billions of years ago. And it turns out, these, the, uh, and I talk about in the book, these back, glutamate plays important roles in these bacteria. I talk about slime molds, uh, glutamate influences their life cycle and responses to the environmental signals like uh, drought or, or wet conditions. And, um, and I also talk about glutamate's roles in things like maternal behavior and the, the development of the brain. 
And this lower right panel here, uh, when I was a kid uh, in the 1960s, and I think into the 70s, there was a, a show we'd watch on Saturday mornings. It was called um, Lancelot Link, Secret Chimp. And um, it's really funny, and, and I enjoyed it a lot, and me and my brother and sister. Uh, and it was uh, chimpanzees dressed up like humans, and they would actually... Have, they do amazing things. This particular image shows the chimpanzee band called the Evolution Revolution, and with these animals playing guitar or tambourine or drums. And of course, they had to to dub in the the voices for the songs. Uh, but anyway, that's kind of interesting from an evolutionary standpoint that uh, glutamate is responsible in large part for the ability of these uh, chimpanzees to to work with humans to and to uh, have bands or <laughs> do other things they do in this interesting show of the 60s. Now, a lot of the research, as you know, uh, basic research in neuroscience is done in animals and the reason is pretty simple you can interrogate the brains of animals in ways that uh, are not uh, okay in humans so you can uh, do experiments you can euthanize the animals with overdose of anesthesia you can take out their brains you can uh, cut sections stain with Golgi stain or use antibodies to label specific proteins you're interested in, for example, glutamate receptors, ampicanate receptors, see where they are and how they change in response to environmental demands or during development or with aging or in animal models of neurological disorders. And it's important to recognize that the, the structures of brains of rats and mice and humans are in many ways, very similar. The connections, for example, between different brain regions, such as the cerebral cortex and the hippocampus, and, and the functions of these brain regions, a huge overlap between rodents and humans. For example, hippocampus, brain region, I studied a lot over the years, critical for learning and memory. It's also involved in uh, regulation of emotions and decision making. It's also connected to um, brain regions such as the, the amygdala, the hypothalamus. And studies of rodents have really provided a lot of insight into glutamate's roles in not only in the, the adult brain under normal healthy conditions, but also in disease conditions, and uh, also in development. Okay, preview now of chapter three, which is entitled Sculpting Baby's Brain. While working as a postdoctoral scientist at Colorado, Colorado State University in the 1980s, I discovered that glutamate plays an important role in the formation of neural networks in the developing hippocampus. At that time, I was performing my experiments, uh, and neuroscientists believed that glutamate acted only as a signal between neurons at synapses. To see whether glutamate might affect the outgrowth of dendrites or axons before synapses are formed, I cultured neurons taken from the hippocampus of developing rat embryos. During the four, first two days in culture, neurons the neurons grew a long axon and several shorter dendrites. After letting the neurons grow for several more days, I took pictures of, pictures of them and then added glutamate to the culture medium. I then took pictures of the same neurons at 4, 8, and 24 hours after exposure to glutamate. For comparison, I took pictures of neurons in cultures that have not been exposed to glutamate. 
My experiments were performed before the advent of digital, digital cameras. So I used a 35 millimeter camera and black and white film. I would write down the sequence of peak pictures, develop the film, and then project the images of the neurons onto a piece of paper using a photographic enlarger used for printing. I traced the projected image of the neurons and so on and so on and so on. And the bottom line is I established an important role for glutamate in controlling the outgrowth of dendrites and the formation of synaptic connections of glutamatergic neurons during brain development. Another quote from that chapter, among the different neurotrophic factors that have been discovered, BDNF is the most robustly produced in the brain in response to activation of glutamate receptors. The increase in BDNF production resulting from glutamate receptor activation serves two main functions in the developing nervous system. It facilitates the formation and stabilization of the synapses, and it supports the survival of neurons. BDNF acts to increase the size of a synapse and the number of mitochondria associated with that synapse. In this way, BDNF may increase the local amount of energy available to support the continued maintenance and function of the synapse. And so this chapter has a lot more, obviously. This whole book is long. It's more than 250 pages. And I'm just trying to give you a flavor of, of some of the themes of the chapters and anecdotes. Uh, but this theme of interactions between uh, glutamatergic neurons and production of BDNF, synaptic plasticity, learning and memory, and then alterations in glutamatergic and BDNF signaling and psychiatric disorders, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, even epilepsy and stroke. <clears throat> and I'm just showing this slide here. Uh, this is from the 1980s, a picture I took of a individual hippocampal what we call pyramidal neuron. This is a glutamatergic neuron in culture. About three days or so, three to four days after this uh, cell was placed in culture, when it was placed in culture, it was a sphere. And over these three to four days, uh, you had a number of processes that grew out from the cell body of the neuron. Uh, most of them are relatively short and are dendrites. And that's where the glutamate receptors are located. And then there's one long process, which is the axon. And each of these growing uh, neurites, whether it's dendrites or axons, at the tip is what's called a growth cone. And down below is a schematic representation of a growth cone. It's like if you look at your hand and you move the fingers, your fingers, the growth cone has finger-like projection called philopodia that probe the environment that the axon or dendrite is growing through. So it is essentially growing on the surface of other cells or on what's called L extracellular matrix proteins. And these philopodia kind of probe the environment. Uh, I found they kind of they kind of stabilize and direct the growth cone. And these are underlain by what's cytoskeletal component, which is polymers of a protein called actin. So these polymers of the protein actin, they can get longer or shorter, and that can be controlled, for example, by calcium. I did a lot of work showing that during my postdoc work in the 80s. And then in what we call the shaft of the axon or dendrite, uh, the long thin part, uh, between the cell body and the growth cone, there's other polymers of a different protein called microtubules, and they, they when they get longer, it kind of pushes the growth cone forward, and that's how you get the extension of the axons or dendrites, uh, as I mentioned, in some cases even from the brain 
<clears throat> down to the spinal cord or the, or the spinal cord to the muscles controlling your foot movement. Okay. And so this, I thought I'd show this slide. It's, throughout the book, I talk about a lot of technologies that have been developed to study neurons and, and, and of course, focus on glutamatergic neurons. And um, a lot of methods, electrophysiology, you can put electrodes on or in neurons and record this voltage potential across the membrane. It can even record movements of individual ions through, say, uh, sodium channels, glutamate receptor channels. One of the technologies that I began to use as a postdoc uh, was developed by Roger Chen, who received the Nobel Prize uh, for developing uh, what's called green fluorescent protein, but perhaps more importantly for developing calcium indicator dyes. They are fluorescent molecules that their fluorescence changes when calcium interacts with them. And these uh, fluorescent calcium sensitive molecules can be introduced into neurons. And then you can image under a microscope, you shine ultraviolet light on the neurons and then their fluorescence will, uh, for example, when you expose them to glutamate, calcium levels will go up and get a change in fluorescence. And that's what's shown in this slide. This is an experiment. I thought really cool experiment. Uh, I did it actually with uh, Peter Guthrie, who was a postdoc in the lab back then. And um, so this is uh, one of my cultured hippocampal neurons here. And calcium levels are represented on a color scale. Uh, blue is low, yellow and red is increasing the higher levels of calcium. And what I did is uh, I took, I actually severed part of the axon. I cut part of the axon here. You can see this break between the distal and proximal regions of the axon. And a lot of times this membrane will seal after I cut these and so this isolated portion of the axon would remain viable and relatively healthy, at least for uh, a few hours after I did this. So anyway, I imaged calcium levels before and after exposure to glutamate. And what one sees is that calcium levels increase a lot in the dendrites and the cell body. And then there's a kind of decreasing calcium concentration as you move out the axon. But the isolated portion of the axon that was not attached to the neuron, there was no increase in calcium levels. And that's because the glutamate receptors are located in the dendrites and not in the axon. And then uh, what I did is I added high concentration of potassium to the culture medium, and that would cause opening of sodium channels in the axon and elevation. So the, the axon uh, does respond to depolarization. And then lastly, for this section on the chapter on glutamate as a kind of a sculptor, sculpture, sculptor of synaptic connectivity during brain development, I had to point out that the brain also contains in addition to neurons, several types of so-called glial cells, astrocytes, which as I mentioned, interact with neurons. They, for example, remove glutamate when it's released. They also have interesting relationship with neurons in terms of energy metabolism, providing, for example, lactate and py pyruvate to neurons. And uh, even more interestingly, they are involved in coupling of activity in neurons to blood flow. So if neurons in a particular brain region, for example, your hippocampus right now, my hippocampus is very active, there's increased in blood flow to that brain region because those neurons need more energy from the glucose and, and then the oxygen used uh, 
in the mitochondria to produce ATP. So it turns out that the there's a method called functional magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, functional MRI, where one can image relative levels of blood flow in different brain regions. And because that blood flow is controlled by the activity of glutamatergic neurons uh, through uh, with the help of astrocytes, what one is actually seeing in these images, functional MRI images of neural network activity in the human brain, is a measure of glutamatergic neuron activity. And this will come up a number of times in the book. Another type of glial cell is the oligodendrocyte that forms the insulation on the axons, the so-called myelination. Uh, and so you'll have these so-called nodes of RANVA. These, uh, the axon will be insulated with the myelin, then there'll be a small gap, and then it'll be insulated again. And this enhances the conduction velocity down the axon. So the oligodendrocytes play a critical role in, in enabling fast synaptic transmission, for example, from the motor neurons in your brain to the spinal cord. Without that myelination, it would take much longer for you to initiate a body movement, uh, which is what your upper motor neurons do. Uh, and then lastly, the last type of glial cell is the microglial cell. It, it has really interesting roles in uh, interacting with neurons. For example, these microglia, uh, we showed a long time, and then it was confirmed later by others that uh, microglia can cause removal of unwanted synapses in a process that I called um, synaptic apoptosis. <laughs> Uh, and that was actually a long time ago. I did that work in the 1990s. But also microglia are well known because they're involved in what's called neuroinflammation uh, because they can produce what are called pro-inflammatory cytokines such as tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-1 beta. And, and in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, other chronic neurological disorders, there's kind of a sustained and low-grade in inflammation occurring, and that is not good. So these microglial cells, well, they can normally do good things uh, in the healthy brain. They can also contribute to bad things in disease states. And um, the last chapter I'm going to cover in this, um, this first uh, podcast kind of preview of my book, Sculptor and Destro Destroyer. Chapter four is called Forget Me Not. And as its name implies, this chapter has to do with learning and memory. Glutamate is the learning and memory neurotransmitter. And pretty much all the work on learning and memory has focused on glutamatergic neurons. So here's the, the two quotes for this chapter, and then I'll, I'll show a couple slides. Many people will be shocked to learn that their brain cells produce gases that are potentially lethal. Neurons produce nitric oxide, hydrogen sulfide, and carbon monoxide when their glutamatergic synapses are activated. And evidence suggests that these gases are involved in learning and memory. Most people have likely heard of instances of death caused by carbon monoxide poisoning from the burning of fuels in an enclosed space. Inhalations of high amounts of hydrogen sulfide, which smells like rotten eggs, can also be deadly. In fact, hydrogen sulfide gas was used as a chemical weapon in World War I. At levels of 100 parts per million or more, nitric oxide also poses an immediate danger to health and survival. All three gases are toxic at high concentration, but they're produced in brain cells in very low amounts in response to activation of glutamate receptors. 
And these three gases play important roles, it's thought, in learning and memory, but also in cellular stress resistance. Uh, and by the way, I, I had a podcast with uh, Bindu Paul from Johns Hopkins University on these three so-called gasotransmitters, nitric oxide, hydrogen sulfide, and carbon monoxide. So if you're interested in learning more about that, you can uh, browse through uh, the list of uh, Brain Ponderings podcasts and find that podcast. Second quote for this chapter, Wilder Penfield, who, who was a, a neurologist up in Canada, he placed a stimulating electrode in the patient's brain while the patient was still conscious and only under local anesthesia. This can be done because in contrast to other tissues throughout the body, the brain does not have pain receptors. Penfield found that the stimulation of the temporal lobes resulted in the recall of memories that were often quite vibrant. Some patients recalled not only memories of past events, but also had dreams or visual or auditory hallucinations. Sometimes patients, sometimes patients had deja vu or out-of-body experiences. Penfield's findings provided evidence that the entire scope of human experiences is encoded in electrically excitable cells. So that was pretty interesting. Uh, that was done a long time ago. Uh, these kinds of experiments aren't typically done nowadays. Uh, this chapter on learning and memory has a huge focus on the hippocampus, and rightfully so. Uh, it has, this brain region, more than any other, uh, has been shown to play critical roles in learning and memory. Turns out that all the information coming from our senses, uh, from our eyes, our ears, you know, smells, taste, uh, touch, uh, even pain, uh, that information goes to the brain, to the, the sensory cortex, cortexes associated with those different senses, visual cortex, auditory cortex, olfactory, uh, somatosensory, et cetera. And that information uh, is funneled into the hippocampus. And so the hippocampus is where we think that uh, correlations between two different inputs are, uh, are then uh, encoded in learning and memory so that we can remember the associations between, for example, a word in an image or uh, you know, a painful experience and, and where you were at the time or what you were doing. And so if you remove the hippocampus from rats or mice uh, bilaterally, they cannot form new memories. Um, if you block glutamate receptors with drugs that block glutamate receptors, uh, the animals can uh, no longer learn new things and remember new things. So short-term memories are encoded. There uh, probably thousands of investigators by now have recorded uh, from postsynaptic glutamatergic neurons in one region of the hippocampus, say the CA1 region, CA1 pyramidal glutamatergic neurons, and then they stimulate the axons of the uh, glutamatergic neurons that provide excitatory input. And uh, early on, and I talk about this in the book historically, what happened, investigators uh, in, in Western Europe uh, showed that if they stimulate the axons at a certain frequency, say high frequency, 100 hertz, 100 times per second, uh, and then then and then record from the postsynaptic neuron. If they come back later, say many minutes or even an hour later, they can just give one stimulation, and the 
magnitude, the strength of the postsynaptic response will be greater than if they had not previously stimulated the inputs at high frequency. That's something called that's something called LTP, long-term potentiation, and it's thought to be a synaptic correlate of learning and memory. It's thought that this process is both uh, necessary and sufficient to encode an initial memory. And um, I mentioned techniques in this. Uh, I, I talk about modern techniques uh, and yeah, uh, yeah. I talk about optogenetics and and so on. Uh, a lot of molecular genetic tools, but uh, one advance that led to a Nobel Prize was the develop what development of what's called patch clamp technology. Uh, essentially, you can put a tiny electrode on a neuron on the surface, and you apply suction, and you can you can either keep the membrane intact or if you suck hard enough on this pipette and actually you do this by, by mouth you have a, a tube connected to this micro electrode and this electrode is hollow with a, a very low small diameter tip and if you apply enough suction it actually breaks the membrane and then the innards of the neuron the cytoplasm that fluid is continuous with the fluid in the pipette. But anyway, uh, Naren Sackman from uh, Heidelberg in Germany developed this technology. It's extremely valuable because you can record currents. If you break through the membrane, you can record whole cell currents, the sum of all the currents through the entire membrane of the neuron, sodium currents. Uh, calcium currents, potassium currents, and the way you isolate the currents is by manipulating the the ion composition of the bathing solution. But anyway, this technique is proved really valuable. We use it a lot, for example, recording uh, GABAergic or glutamatergic uh, responses. Um, the in rodents, what one learning and memory, uh, I guess classification you'd say that we we and others have studied a lot is what's called spatial navigation, the ability of the mouse or rat to navigate through a maze and and find either a food reward or there's other way other this water maze. A uh, method where you have a pool and a hidden platform, and the rat or mouse they don't like to be in the water. So uh, once they know where the platform is, you put them in the water, they'll more quickly go to the platform because they can remember its locations. So anyway, the spatial navigation obviously this is important in evolution. It's important for us too navigating as we we drive or walk through cities although gps may be uh, eliminating that need in humans but anyway uh there was a nobel prize given for john o'keefe uh may Britt, and edvard moser uh, for their identification of what are called either place cells or grid cells that kind of a an internal map that's encoded in neurons in the hippocampus or an adjacent region, the anorenal cortex. And um, so I talk about that. Okay. Ah, I forgot about this chapter. Before I get to the destroyer part, one more chapter. Chapter five, Seeking Energy. So I mentioned this relationship between Neural activity, which increases energy demand, and blood flow, uh, which you can actually image with fMRI. It turns out that much as, I think anyway, much as the, the branches of trees or plants grow towards sunlight, 
which in a sense is the energy source, right? The, the UV light hits the leaves and then through this process of photosynthesis, glucose, cellular energy sources produced. Um, there's quite a bit of evidence that, uh, extensive evidence that energy metabolism in the brain is highly regulated and that the the machinery, the mitochondria and other cell met metabolic pathways involved in energy metabolism are tightly linked to activity in the neurons. And interestingly, that energy metabolism also plays important roles in controlling the structure and function of neural circuits. So here's three quotes from this chapter. An article entitled Computers Versus Brains in the November 2011 issue of Scientific American caught my eye. The article compared data storage capacities, processing speed, and energy consumption of an iPad 2, the fastest supercomputer, a human brain, and a cat brain. The data storage capacity of the human brain was estimated to be a million times more than that of the iPad 2 and only slightly less than that of the largest supercomputer. Even more remarkable was evidence that the processing speed of the human brain was similar to that of the supercomputer and much faster than an iPad. The cat brain was estimated to be similar to an iPad 2 in its storage capacity and processing speed. The article also compared the energy efficiency of the human brain with that of the supercomputer and concluded that the human brain was about 500,000 times more energy efficient. So using glucose or ketones, which are the other main energy source for neurons during fasting or extended exercise, uh, the energy generated from them uh, in terms of its conversion in a relation of processing speed or, or you know, yet yeah, processing speed is much greater than computers. So evolution is still ahead of man-made things in that regard. Another quote, the activity of neural networks consumes a great deal of energy. In fact, although the brain is only about 2% of the total body weight, it consumes up to 20% of the energy of the person at rest. The vast majority of the brain's energy consumption results from the activity of glutamatergic neurons. When activity in the neural networks of a particular brain region increases, the blood flow to that region increases to provide more oxygen and energy to the neuron. In fact, it is the blood flow that is being detected by fMRI brain scans. And because more than 90% of the neurons throughout the brain are glutamatergic, fMRI imaging signals can be considered a reflection of the activity of the glutamatergic neurons. Then lastly, and this is some work actually from, from my lab, a number of people in my lab, the BDNF produced in response to glutamate receptor activation plays an important role in the ensuing mitochondrial biogenesis. So that is to say, BDNF, this important neurotrophic factor, it will stimulate neurons uh, in a way that causes mitochondria to divide and then grow. So this is, uh, and BDNF, since it promotes the outgrowth of dendrites and is involved in for example, enlargement of synapses or formation of new synapses, it makes sense that the cell would want to have more mitochondria and place those mitochondria close to the growing part of the dendrite or to the, the synapse that is forming or being activated. And that's what seems to happen. So there is this interesting relationship between activity BDNF production, uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, and allocation of energy, uh, both spatially and temporally.
Yeah, and, and so I mentioned, I talk about in this chapter, <laughs> this interesting similarities uh, between branches of trees and, and <laughs> in particular in some other plants and the branches of dendritic arbors, the dendrites of neurons. And this has been recognized and, and kind of talked about uh, for a long time, but um, it hadn't been appreciated until recently that, you know, energy acquisition uh, factors influence its patterning. And actually these patterns, there's a something that's called fractal patterning. So the branching of tree branches, the branching of your blood vessels, uh, the branching of dendrites, uh, at least of, of some neuron, larger neurons seems to follow this fractal pattern, which maximize uh, uh, acquisition of energy or distribution of energy in the case of blood vessels, distribution of oxygen, glucose, and other nutrients. Yeah, so and I think I'll, I'll quit there for that chapter. So that's the introduction to the sculptor part of Sculptor and Destroyer. In the next episode, uh, I'll talk about the destroyer side and also the role of glutamate in in uh, mental health and in pharmacology, you know, drug development and discovery, things like psychedelics, which is very emerging now from a clinical standpoint as being effective. So I talk about all these in the book, uh, and I'll, I'll briefly uh, give a few quotes and a few slides as I did for this first um, preview of Sculptor and Destroyer. So until the next episode, uh, thanks for bearing with me. I hope you're interested in these things and want to know more. Uh, and I hope you're having a good summer. Goodbye.